So just a quick introduction and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Salti. Dr. Ramzi Salti has been a full-time lecturer in Arabic at Stanford University since 1998. He authors his own Arabology blog and hosts a weekly radio program titled Arabology, which airs on KZSU Stanford 90.1 FM. In addition to his academic writing, Dr. Salti has also worked as an entertainment writer for various magazines and has published dozens of articles about the music and film industries. We'd like to give a warm welcome to Dr. Salti. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Oh, ooh, I'm very, how clear. So I really want to say thank you to everybody who helped this old man learn about Zoom and learn how to get online today. And uh, of course, uh, Epic, the pro, you are indeed Epic. And I want to say thank you to Denise who introduced me and who has been helping me through this Zoom experience. Please bear with me if I... If I make any mistakes, Denise is at my side. So Denise, in terms of starting the lecture, I'm going to be sharing, I think, uh, most of all my um, screen with everybody because this is a very uh, audio-visual uh, talk. And so, yes, um, so basically, there, so everybody can see now uh, the... Uh, playlist. So thank you for welcoming me to the uh, Silicon Valley, to the age of technology. And in return, I'm going to take you on a journey through the music that fueled the Arab Spring. And uh, the, the title of my talk today is uh, Arab Spring Music from Revolution to Revelation. And uh, really, I was going to call it from an Arabic spring to an Arabic winter, just because that's becoming the new term. Whatever happened to the Arab Spring, was it hijacked? Is it still going on? Certainly, uh, it didn't live up to the ideal dream that many people, especially young people in the Arab world had. But does that mean that the whole idea of an Arab Spring has died? Has it really turned into an Arab winter? Or does the music that fueled the Arab uprisings back in 2010 it, does that music still exist? And I'm going to posit the notion today that though the Arab Spring politically may have failed and arguably only succeeded in Tunisia, uh, the, uh, the music that fueled the Arab Spring continues to evolve and continues to, uh, to challenge certain norms. They're challenging certain political systems. So this whole Arab Spring, this whole uprising that happened that started in Tunisia and then went into other places, uh, including Egypt, Libya, and on and on, uh, eventually landing in Syria. And that's going to be the last part of my talk today. My, my uh, vision and my view is that it is this music that is keeping the idea of an Arab Spring alive. And uh, just as a shameless plug, I want to say that um, I have a radio show right here at Stanford at KZSU 90.1 FM. That radio show is called Arabology. And uh, it started five years ago and I started showcasing music by um, uh, Arab Spring artists, musicians who fueled the Arab Spring. So when the show started, it got quite a bit of uh, reaction from American listeners who were glad to have somebody translate the songs that were fueling the events that we were seeing on the news. But at the same time, Arab people or, the, or, or Arabs from various Arab countries were starting to write to the show and saying, I've got music that I did. I was in Tahrir Square. Um, I lost somebody there, you know. So the show kind of got a, a dual identity, being an Arab-American show and having a listenership that is basically in Northern California. But then through the podcast, the, uh, the show started reaching the Middle East. And now I think the number one market I have have in terms of people listening when I look at the graphs that follow the podcast is Egypt. So that's right there an indication how, of how this music has not died down in Egypt. In, in fact, we have such a slew of new musicians who are challenging the system in Egypt and, uh, and who continue to do so. And Egypt being one of the most culturally relevant 
countries in the Arab world, from Egyptian cinema to Egyptian music. Uh, you know, they tend to sort of represent the Arab world in many ways. Well, then it's an indication that the Arab Spring music, at least, has not died or turned into winter. In fact, I would even argue that it has blossomed. What I will argue, though, is that, uh, you know, what is the, the whatever was happening politically, um, it is not necessarily what is being reflected. In fact, the music is going to reflect an oppositional movement to the music of the Arab Spring. So uh, the, uh, the YouTube playlist that you see is one that I think was uh, emailed to you, and it has 50 songs that I tried to put chronologically. If you don't have that document, it is no problem because you can see it on the screen and uh, I have shared the URL. This is actually a public playlist on YouTube that anybody can find. Uh, the, you, I, this is my YouTube channel, Ramsey Salty, and the playlist is called Arab Spring Music. But you really don't need to uh, be focused on that. I'll do all the work. I want you guys to at least initially kick back and uh, let the music of the Arab Spring come to you. Uh, but I wanted to note that it is chronological. Okay, and uh, the other thing I want to say is that instead of playing, you know, I'm not going to play 50 songs, obviously, although we, will, we have 50 here, I'll try to uh, do a representative song from each uh, country, um, or, or at least the major countries. But I thought instead of waiting till the end of this, where you have been taken through an audiovisual journey of the Arab Spring music from 2010 till today, um, I think like after each song, I welcome a brief comment or two I think you know I'm really interested to hear about your immediate reaction to that song to the lyrics and finally I don't know how many of you speak Arabic but even if you don't don't worry about it because I picked uh, I try I really looked and I tried to find versions of these songs with English subtitles though again the visual sometimes overpowers the lyrics where you don't even need to know what they're saying to understand and of course there's a lot uh, there's many of them that are instrumentals and things like that. So with everybody's permission, I'm going to say uh, salam, which means peace in Arabic, and uh, bonjour, and hello, and shalom, and uh, welcome everybody to uh, a trip through uh, the music of the Arab Spring, which, as I said, began in 2010. And uh, really, the, the, it's very interesting how historically we can actually pinpoint an event that led to the beginning of the Arab Spring. I mean, you could go to a day, you could go to a specific, a specific event, and usually revolutions and uprisings, you know, they, they, they take a while now. It was always in the making, but there was this one event that really began everything, and that was in uh, February of, um, uh, uh, sorry, in December, the 18th of December, 2010 in a place called Sidi Bouazid in Tunisia. There was a man who's very well known till today, whose name is Mohammed Bouaziz, and who set himself on fire. He did so in protest uh, against the uh, regime at the time, the fact that there was so much poverty, that the Tunisian people had such educated people, people with PhDs were, couldn't even find a job as, you know, doing even hard labor. I mean, it was a really, really sad state of affairs. And this man, Mohammed Bouazizi, in protest, uh, he, was, uh, he was selling vegetables in a cart, and basically he set himself on fire and uh, in, in protests, and of course, that horrific incident led people to rise up in solidarity, eventually toppling the Tunisian regime, and of course, it then spilling into Egypt, and I guess the rest is history. So uh, uh, that the day that he set himself on fire is the day is the day this song started to play incessantly in the streets of Tunisia, and uh, and and uh, through the internet because this is of course a very internet driven revolution we're talking about the Arab Spring uh, through Twitter through this uh, this song was being shared. I'm going to actually show you the very song that I think is the first song. To, uh, to stand up against any kind of uh, uh, government in the Arab world. It, and of course, the singer, his name is El General, and I 
think you can see him uh, here, is actually uh, uh, was at, was actually uh, tortured. He was interrogated, and yet the song literally went viral. Now, of course, there are many versions on the internet today. I found you one with the English uh, subtitles, and uh, you can follow along now. This is his message. This is El General's message. He is the famous Tunisian rapper who uh, who released a song for the president or against the president, and uh, the song is called Rais Leblad. It means president of the country, and here he is lamenting the state of the country. So does anybody want to react to what you just saw? This was a rapper rapping in Arabic, and this song is considered the staple, the song that began this kind of genre called the Arab Spring music. I can't help but think that he kind of sounds very similar to Eminem in, in terms of his style, that aggressive hip hop type of style. It's like uh, expressing frustration, I would say. So, uh, hi, Philip. Thank you for speaking. Uh, so basically, I, I think it even looks like Eminem in the video. I'm wondering how much of this is deliberate. Obviously, uh, these rappers are heavily influenced by the West. In fact, the whole idea of rap and hip hop came from the West. But I would say that, you know, he did a brilliant job of taking that Western genre, you know, sort of what was happening in New York in terms of the hip hop scene, Eminem and others, and sort of taking it, but then making it relate to his own situation and using these powerful Arabic lyrics. I hope you were able to read some of the subtitles as he was reading. I mean, it was just a, a one complaint after another against the president of the country. And I think it worked really well in terms of being a hip hop song because it was almost like a letter to the president. Um, that, did, did everybody else sort of feel that it was sort of a, an Arabic version of Western hip hop? Yes, I was gonna say, uh, even if you didn't have the translation, you could pretty much understand what was being said <laughs> or, or rapped. I love that you said that, Nancy, because that's why some of the videos you're not going to find an English subtitled version. But I think nevertheless, you'd be able to kind of just by giving you a context, see it. So I'm going to move on. And of course, please make notes and we can come back to any of these videos at the end. And it might be nice at the end to also welcome, I welcome questions that maybe we can talk about the whole journey today, the whole audiovisual journey today. Um, but I want to stay in Tunisia and I want to move from El General, who we just heard, to a young woman who is a powerhouse. She was so young when the uh, revolution started. Her name is Amal Mathluthi. And what she started really in the streets, you can see her here, uh, as part of the protests in the streets. Now, Amal Matsluthi uh, uh, composes her own lyric, uh, songs, melodies, and lyrics. And in uh, shortly after El General, she took to the streets along with her fellow Tunisian uh, friends and uh, colleagues and sort of st went into the street and sang this song, which I think you can see here is called My Word is Free free in the sense of unencumbered, free in the sense that it will not be silenced. In Arabic, it's kilmiti hurra. And she sang this in the street with that angelic voice that moved people literally to tears. Now, obviously, I hate to tell you, but this is expected, that when uh, Amal's song, kilmiti hurra, began to go viral, she was arrested herself. She was tortured, um, and she endured a lot, yet she would leave the jail, go back into the street after being released, and sing Kilmiti Hurra, which became the anthem of uh, the Arab Spring at that point. Uh, just as an aside, a few years ago, I was able to get Amal Mathuthi to come here and perform at the Bing Concert Hall at Stanford. It was the most amazing thing to know that this young lady who came from nothing, who was tortured, who sang in the streets, ended up singing at the prestigious uh, Bing Concert Hall right here at Stanford to a sold out audience. It was one of the most uplifting things. So we're going to see her here as she started. And then I'm going to show you a small portion of her performance at the Nobel Prize ceremony where 
where she was invited to sing the song with an orchestra. So I'd like you to juxtapose the way it started, very organic in the street, to the kind of orchestral tune that Kilmeti Hurra, this song, became. So here she is, her name is Amal Mathluthi. <laughs> Um, before I uh, I ask you about Amal Masluthi, were you able to read the subtitles on your screens, or were they covered at the bottom? Okay, uh, mine was covered, but I speak Arabic, so I didn't need them. Uh, uh, so I'm so glad you were able to read the lyrics because she wrote the lyrics herself, and and the I that she's singing about is really that collective we. Now, what? did you guys think of Amal Masluthi from uh, the streets of Tunisia, which was the first clip, to the Nobel Prize uh, ceremony where you saw how elaborate and orchestral everything was? Oh, I'd just simply add that the initial clip of her singing in the streets, it was so powerful because it was just so raw it's just her and her voice yeah. uh, so it was interesting i would have thought that i would prefer the more produced version later but i really liked the first singing yeah i think um sorry who 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 gave oh, that's andrew hill hi sorry. andrew Andrew, your comment actually really is aligned with what amal masluthi herself says she says this song was never meant to be with an orchestra, you know, and, and, uh, and in a lavish hall. I mean, she really enjoyed the, the uh, performance and she felt that, you know, honored to be invited. But to this day, and even at the Bing Concert Hall, when it came to this song, she told the musicians to stop. She got her guitar and she sang it organically the way you, you were uh, describing it. So I, 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 not only do I agree with you that this song when overproduced sort of loses some of its powerful uh, aspects, but also the singer herself still does it with the guitar, sort of like, or acoustically. Um, okay. I, I, I have a comment. I remember reading that uh, there was kind of a purist acceptance uh, to her artistic approach in her song. And to me, you can see um, from the very beginning, her journey, her communicative power, and how it speaks to uh, what the people desire, their desire for freedom, for liberty, but it is so uh, eloquently expressed in that it is also representative of a peaceful type of movement uh, by the way that she sings the song. Indeed, I, uh, and I think it, in some ways it reminded me of, you know, the 60s in, in the States and civil rights movement. But I do want to say, and your comment is, is so appreciated, but I did want to say that obviously the Arab Spring, you know, they called it the Jasmine uh, Revolution in Tunisia, but it was bloody. I mean, people were being persecuted by the government and Tunisia, you know, and just, just the two singers we've played so far, both of them were arrested, both of them were violated. And, uh, and so the, uh, the actual demonstrators, yes, they were holding jasmines and they were peaceful. However, the response was so yes. bloody. Yes. That, that, you know, the, when people say, oh, it happened very beautifully and organically, no, a lot of people mm -hmm. lost their lives, uh, as they did in the civil rights movement back here in the States back in the 60s. And, you know, I would argue still today. But um, so. and, and I think that's the power behind her voice, even though that it, it was a very violent movement, the way that she sings the song, the song echoes peace from within, despite the, the terror of the movement, so to speak, the desire from within. Yes, and I'm going to relay your message to Amal Masluthi herself. I told her I'm going to be playing your song to very amazing people today. She'll, so with your permission, I'm going to quote you. She's mm -hmm. it's going to make her very happy. She lives in New York at the time, at this moment. Um, so while uh, I think I'm going to end Egypt here, uh, I mean, sorry, I'm going to uh, end our Tunisian segment here, which is where the Arab Spring began. And as I said, through the internet, through people, through Twitter, people started 
started organizing all these protests. The government was not so technologically savvy. So by the time they found out that there was going to be a demonstration somewhere, the young people using technology were able to get there and begin the protests and begin making an impact. And by the time the government got there, it was often too late. Uh, the crowds that would result would be unmanageable by the government. It was really the voice of the people. And that, I think, could be seen really in uh, Egypt. I mean, I don't know how many of you <clears throat> were tuned in to the Egyptian revolts, but I have never seen so many people in Tahrir Square or in Egypt. And I have been to Egypt several times, and I, that's usually a very quiet, well, not quiet, but it's a very normal uh, neighborhood with Tahrir Square and cars and buses, and suddenly for that to be the center of millions. Uh, coming down without arms and sort of standing up against the Mubarak regime. So one of the singers that became maybe equivalent to what El General was in Tunisia was a young man named Rami Isam, who again would take his guitar and go into Tahrir Square in Cairo in Egypt and sing against Mubarak. This guy was really roughed up, though. I mean, where in Tunisia they would be arrested and then sort of let go, um, Rami Assam endured the kind of torture that leaves marks both physically and uh, mentally. I'm going to have, I'm going to show you just a part of uh, a report about him in English. So this is a segment where Rami is finally speaking about what he went through. Again, his name is Rami Isam. And obviously, he uh, consequently had to leave the country or he ran uh, out of the country. He is now an asylee in Sweden, where he continues to sing against the regime. Now, of course, since Mubarak, you know, then we had Mursi in uh, Egypt, and now we have Sisi. But if you ask a typical you know, young person in Egypt, you know, was this the result that you wanted? They'll uh, mostly tell you that uh, they believe that the CC regime is uh, just as brutal as uh, the previous ones, that this was not the uh, kind of uh, res result they were hoping for when they were taking to the streets. And Rami Isam himself uh, has released songs where he directly attacks Sisi and says that the blood of his of the martyrs, of the young people in Tahrir Square was were not shed to put someone like Sisi in, the, in power. Um, I'm going to show you now in, in Sweden how his songs have evolved. I think you're going to say the same thing as Amal, that it may be overproduced, but this song became very catchy, and you can see now he has a budget, so it's, it's subtitled, and it's called Bread and Freedom, in Arabic, Aish, Hurriya, Adala, Ishtima'iya, which means bread, freedom, and social justice, uh, and he used uh, many young people to uh, sort of echo that thought. They're all from different walks of Egyptian society. And uh, here he is with subtitles. So again, I hate to interrupt this music, but it, everything's available on the YouTube list you have for you to later discover and, and, and rediscover. But that was Rami Isam. I wonder if any of you had heard of, of him before. And if you haven't, what, what did you think of the kind of musical productions this young man is trying to produce. It has a little more of a pop appeal. That's and, I wanted, and I wanted to add to that, I have not heard of him, but my best friend is Egyptian, so I always heard growing up, Yala Habebti. Oh, wow. And so <laughs> that for me, speak Arabic. <laughs> no, I can say Yala Habebti. Those are the me, most important sounds, words. <laughs> for, but for me, it sounded very traditional in the music in the very beginning. And then, as I agree with Philip, more commercial and more polished. And so I prefer more of the raw music that you heard in Tunisia. Yeah, I love you I'd guys for, for, for caring about the, the uh, message and not the package. Um, so, you know, in a way, these young revolutionary musicians from Tunisia and Egypt suffered a lot. And they actually sort of are glad that they got record companies now that they continue to release their music. But it is certainly sanitized and it does lose something. Thank God for YouTube and other places where we can still find them. Um, their organic versions. Um, and uh, Jennifer, you know, Yalla Habibi means let's go, dear, right? 
What does Yalla Aberti mean? Yalla is let's go, and Habibti is my dear. So oh no, what, what Jennifer um, did it earlier? <laughs> then, right, what, right, what did you see Jennifer a while ago? Yalla Aberti? Yalla Habibti. Don, if you want to learn Arabic, I've been teaching yes, I do. at Stanford 20 years. Come to my classes. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> I would, you are more than welcome. <laughs> well, um, you know, for the sake of time, I'm going to jump to uh, track number 17 in our um, playlist because I would have liked to play some more musicians from Egypt, but I think, uh, you know, for the sake of time, I'd like to take you outside of Egypt and see how the music of the Arab Spring then started uh, spilling into uh, uh, Libya. And of course, the result in Libya was nothing like the results in uh, Egypt or, or, of course, Tunisia. Uh, Libya became even more chaotic. The kind of uh, young people's movements there were squashed. And uh, really, nothing, uh, things became much worse for, the Li for Libyan youth. Um, but um, the, here's a song by a guy who goes by Ibn Thabit. I mean, the fact that he won't use his real name tells you to what degree Libyan singers who sing against the system, at the time it was Gaddafi, uh, who sing uh, uh, against the system, how, how afraid they are of being prosecuted and tortured. So this is, uh, uh, this is one of the few um, Libyan young singers who sang against oppression. Uh, his name is Ibn Thabit, and the song is called Victory or Death. It has subtitles. Um, does anybody want to react to the very short clip that we saw by Ibn Thabit from Libya? That just seemed like real protest music. That was, again, a very different feel to it in that it's, it's just got kind of the, the anger driving it in terms of protesting against the situation. Yeah, and, and, and the power of that in reaching people. Now, obviously, uh, the video clip that you saw was not actually produced by the artist. It was just a song, and somebody took it and put these visual images, they imposed it upon the song, and then put the English subtitles. I just used it because I thought, if you want to get an idea about what they're um, singing about. But you guys don't seem to need the subtitles, which I think is goes with my argument that sometimes the message of music, you don't really need to understand every word or to even know what they're saying to kind of feel the anger and the goal of this kind of music. So I'm going to move um, from, yeah, from uh, Libya to uh, uh, Algeria. And this is a singer whose name is Rashid Taha, who sadly passed away a few months ago at the age of 59. I had seen him live in concert here in San Francisco at Stern Hall uh, when we would go to the festivals in the parks here. And, and he was just a powerhouse. This guy, nothing stopped him. And he, he tragically died, I think, of a heart attack or something earlier this year. He comes from Algeria. And although he had been very popular before any kind of Arab Spring, before, way before 20 years or a couple of decades before he had started to have these hits, the hits kind of regained popularity and he became an avid supporter of the youth who were singing against oppression. So here's one of his most famous songs. May, uh, may he rest in peace, he passed away this year. Uh, but I think it's going to give you an idea about how this song, which talks about immigrants. Now, he's Algerian and he uh, lived in France. And so in a lot of ways, when he came to fame in France, 20 years before the Arab Spring, he was singing about the, 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 uh, the immigrant experience of being an Algerian and moving to France. Um, any reaction to this kind of music as compared to what you heard in the beginning or up until now? I feel like it's a little more ethnic to the region. Um, and the other one, I think the other ones are more, uh, some of them sound a little more pop and more Western influence. And he is older, if you notice. So, you know, he wasn't part of that youth generation, but he's, he was an amazing uh, singer and activist, I think, because he became the voice of uh, the Algerian immigrants who went to France. Some of them were born there. Then they were second generation immigrants. They called them les beurs. 
en français. And basically, you know, they've had a problem in terms of their identity. And then, of course, with France imposing certain laws that apply to Muslims and not non-Muslims, you know, there was this whole debate. And he came back and this song you heard called the Araya, which I used to listen to when I was a kid. <laughs> well, maybe in my 30s, uh, that song sort of came back and the youth were singing it. So I'm going to, yes, Mary. Yeah, I just had a comment. I think it's, uh, uh, I listened to a lot of the music you already are playing, except not, not these, not this one, but um, it seems like it's, um, uh, his is more reflective of, of the diaspora experience of, um, and uh, it kind of reminds me of Rebetica. I don't know, the Greek uh, <laughs> uh, community that left the Middle East and, and had to, to settle move, elsewhere. All right, and had to settle elsewhere. Yeah. So I think there, there's something um, almost, I mean, oh, you're talking about the uniqueness of, in some ways, of the Arab experience. I think there's something very universal about the um, diaspora and how it alters the, well, what it does. <laughs> Absolutely. Because also, Mary, like up until 2010, when the Arab Spring began, Arabic music was very sort of formulaic. I mean, there were huge singers, you know, with commercial success and, and big record companies and, you know, making millions. But it was very sanitized. It was, you know, my, my boyfriend left me and my girlfriend doesn't love me. And, uh, you know, very danceable, very nice music. But it was never powerful. It was always censored, like a, a no... Arabic record company would release a track where uh, the government was being, uh, you know, criticized in any way. And so this music, I mean, we call it alternative Arabic music or underground Arabic music. Mm -hmm. It is, you know, we saw in some cases how that was now becoming a little more mainstream, but in that it lost some of its power. But uh, in terms of uh, Rashid Taha, he did have a contract and, and, and you know, eventually raised to this legendary status where he was able to maybe get away with a little more than what a young person uh, starting uh, their musical journey would, would be able to do. Did he, did he perform in the Arab world too or just yes. in? Oh, oh yeah, he, he performed in the Arab world. When he would go to Algeria, I mean, people would <laughs> stalk the airport for days to just to see him come down from the plane. It was, you know, the, uh, the immigrant that went to France made it big and never gave up his language or his uh, cultural identity. And so, you know, fought for the rights of uh, Algerian immigrants in France, coming back to the mother country. And, you know, he's a very interesting man. Try to look up just some of the amazing articles that came out about him after he passed away a few months ago. It was really shocking. He was still in his 50s. I can say that very well. Uh, so uh, I'm going to take you now because there, there, no presentation on Arab Spring music should uh, not include the following group. Now, when I say the next two words, they're not going to mean anything to you, maybe to some of you, maybe. But remember the name of this band, because this band, sooner or later, is going to infiltrate every household, both in the East and the West. They're called Mashru'a Layla. And uh, they, they are a band that comes from Lebanon. They were initially students at the American University in Beirut. And they, uh, they, they loved music. They were kind of like musicians, but they didn't have musical training. They would get together at the AUB. And uh, they, would, uh, they started a workshop and they started this band, which is called Mashru'a Layla. Now, Mashru'a Layla means Layla's project, or it could also mean in Arabic, project of one night. And, uh, and so they started out singing against, um, against, well, let me put it this way. The, the lead singer that you see on the screen right now, that's the lead singer from Mashro Leila, who uh, was very young when they started in his 20s, was the first singer, musician from the Arab world to come out as openly a, a, a gay singer. So he said, I am gay, and I am Lebanese, and I sing in Arabic, and I am Muslim, and I am singing against oppression, and I am tying in any kind of sexism and oppression, political persecution with homophobia. And that, of course, just exploded all over the place. It led to this band being banned. Of course, in the Gulf countries, they were banned. But even Jordan, which isn't necessarily one of those countries that normally would ban singers for their, they were banned in Jordan. Their native Lebanon kind of embraced them, but 
they made it really big in Europe and now in the States. They've been to the States a couple of times. You couldn't get a ticket. And I think, especially San Francisco, I think the gay community kind of, you know, talking about. Now, to me, it looks like a young Freddie Mercury, too. Uh, and, you know, considering that right now in the theaters, we've got Bohemian Rhapsody. I always thought this guy should have played Fred, Freddie Mercury. But Rami Malik did a really good job because, you know, that's another sort of uh, favorite of mine. So I'm going to show you this little report about them and what they do. Their name is Mashrua Layla, Project of One Night. And they really have been shaking things up in the Middle East for about 10 years now, and they continue to do so despite being banned. So please look them up if you have time at your leisure and just look at some of the videos they've been producing, even visually, it goes along with these lyrics. Their name is Mashrua Layla, the Layla Project, or Project of One Night, and they continue to go strong. Uh, so this is sort of Lebanon's contribution to the Arab Spring, uh, and sort of the Levant. Are there any uh, comments about the fact that for the first time, I think in musical Arab history, uh, we had uh, sort of somebody discussing, you know, homosexuality so blatantly in their songs and being openly gay and putting themselves, of course, at risk. My comment was simply that the way the crowd was reacting, it was like the Beatles had arrived. <laughs> <laughs> and I think what you saw there was, you know, when they were first coming up on the scene, they hadn't been banned, and they would sing like that, and the young people would go. I don't think their parents understood that they were going to see this really subversive music and band. But once the uh, male singer that you saw, the lead singer, Hamid Sinno, came out, that was in all the papers, that was on the TV shows, and, you know, so the parents were stopping their kids from going to the concert, which, you know, we say in Arabic, the more you're prohibited, the more the kids are going to want it. And so in a way, it started a whole discourse on marginalized sexualities in the Arab world that wouldn't have existed otherwise. Um, you know, it, writers have tackled this, the subject, especially Moroccan writers in the past. But uh, to do it in music and reach the actual people, they were considered dangerous. But because their music was so addicting and so popular, as you saw, it was really hard for some of these kids who may have gotten homophobic messages at home to actually reject the band. So they would have to sort of have to choose between the band and the message. Well, at some point, the band and the message are the same since they're singing about the very topics that are being for, uh, forbidden. Which is another parallel to Freddie Mercury. Yes. <laughs> and another reason Hamid Sinna should have played uh, Freddie Mercury. <laughs> I keep harping on that. <laughs> you guys are amazing. Uh, so uh, I, I see the time is going by so quickly and I'm, I'm skipping quite a bit because I, I think we really need to show you what's going on in Syria. Um, you know, in terms of what about Syrian singers when the Arab Spring, which at, I think at this point was an Arab winter, spilled into Syria, uh, you had a completely different, you know, uh, power play going on with the Assad regime, which is still in power, the entrance of uh, ISIS into the uh, equation, and then, of course, the West and Syria being the tragically horrible place it is now. But the music continues to happen by the Syrian artists. And here I'm going to say that un uncontestably, the king of uh, this kind of music in Syria or from Syria is a rapper whose name is Omar Ofendam. And uh, he is Syrian, but he lives in America now. So he's Syrian American and he sings in Arabic and in English. And this is, I think the song says it all. It's called Hashtag Syria. And by, uh, uh, you know, this song also represents the kind of Syrian feeling of the youth who were try initially going to the streets, hoping to topple the regime and get more freedom, but then ended up in, in, in a worse situation. Hopefully this is just a step towards eventual freedom and democracy, we shall see. But the, the main motto in Syria, as in the rest of the Arab world was, Ashab Yurid Isqat and Nidharm, the people want the overthrowing of the regime. And so he begins his songs with that very popular call for freedom. Yeah, sorry for the, uh, some of the uh, violent imagery in the video. That is actually a video that uh, Omar Ofendam himself produced. So it's not somebody else sort of imposing. This is the 
his uh, officially released uh, video. Um, you know, he is a Syrian American rapper, so that's why he sings in, in English. But as you heard, there was Arabic throughout, and he does speak Arabic. He also came to Stanford a few years ago and uh, wowed the masses. Any reaction to Syrian uh, uh, revolution in music? Was that more targeted towards a younger, obviously English speaking um, Arabs? Arabs? I think so. I think this was his target is more like Arab Americans who uh, sort of don't know what's going on there. Sometimes you've got now, you know, with everything going on and this kind of demonization of the Arab world of Muslims of, you know, that all the Arabs are Muslim, which is of course not even true. But, uh, you know, I think he is the voice of the Arab American revolution. Having said that, people in Syria love his music because they feel it's one of our own who like is speaking for us in the West. So although they can't really sing the English, and it's hard to sing rap in English when you don't speak English, uh, you know, there, it, it's still Omar Ofendam has become a household name there. And uh, I think that's why he always makes sure to include Arabic messages, even if his Arabic may not be flawless himself. I see. So he was kind of acting like a conduit between like the West and the Middle and the Middle East. Indeed, indeed. And I think that his whole message is that identity is fluid and you don't have to choose whether you are Syrian or American or Arab or Syrian, you know, within this identity. Like, what are you, Arab? Are you Syrian? Are you, you know, uh, the idea is, is identity is fluid to him and he's singing in terms of also on this global scale against all oppression. Uh, and harking back to the times, uh, you know, where our country here in the U.S., when we were going through similar changes. So the time is really going, I'm going to end, I think, because we're, we're uh, you know, out of 50 songs, I ended up playing maybe uh, half a dozen here. Uh, I, I'm going to end with uh, sort of the, what was happening uh, to Palestinians within the Arab Spring because the Palestinians have been you know, protesting for decades, I would say, sort of uh, decided to piggyback on what was going on in terms of the Arab Spring and uh, speak about their own situation um, under what they perceive as occupation. And so um, a group of Palestinian singers who kind of were musicians on their own got together and created a collective that is called 47 Soul. So we are looking now at uh, uh, song number 49. And uh, what they did is really revolutionary, maybe not just in terms of the music that they produced, but also the imagery and the fact that they were able to take Arabic traditions, like the traditional Arabic dance, which is called the Dapka. I don't know if you've ever seen it, with people holding hands and... Uh, uh, you know, doing sort of like an Irish step dance or something, but with an Arabic twist. Well, they took that and they sing in Arabic and in English. So when they sing in Arabic, their videos have the English subtitles. And when they sing in English, they put the Arabic subtitles. So you could totally tell that their uh, target audience is both the East and the West. But also the message is to keep Palestinian her the Palestinian heritage alive. And, um, you know, no matter where Palestinians are, whether in the diaspora or in Gaza or, or, or in the Palestinian territories, whatever, wherever they may be, uh, they, uh, they've embraced them. And the songs are really good. I mean, they're very addicting. They've got, they're produced very well, but they're produced by the musicians themselves and not by some record company that imposed anything on them. So I won't say more because I, I could never sort of convey it. I think the music will say it all. It's called the Mo Light in Arabic, Rafatir, and you're going to hear Arabic music like you've never heard it before. And it might be a good way to end the visual component of my talk today. Okay, so uh, I wish we had, you know, hours to kind of take you through everything, but I wanted to end with uh, this song by uh, 47 Soul to get your reaction to it. And then uh, depending on our time, Denise, um, can we have a couple of questions? Okay. Um, so uh, yeah, what did you think of, uh, of them? And Denise, maybe I should come back now okay. to the view where I am speaking with my amazing audience directly. Uh, anybody want to say anything about what you just saw? Well, 
What I'll say, this is Andrew Hill again. I just wanted to say that uh, with that particular video, I was struck by how different it is to listen to just the audio versus listening to the music set to the images, reinforcing the lyrics, reinforcing the message, reinforcing the feel of the music. And um, boy, it's wrapped together. They can be really powerful combination. So if you had heard the audio without having seen the video, how would it have hit you? Like in what way? Yeah. Uh, see, I think very differently, which is that especially um, even with um, a combination of English and Arabic, uh, when I'm hearing just the audio, I'm trying to listen, I'm trying to understand, I'm trying to sort it out. But with the visuals, it's just more of an experience you kind of let flow over you. And it, I, I just don't have such the analytical approach when I'm watching the video as well. Yeah. Uh, do you feel that the visual element added to the song? Oh, or, or? Yeah, no, I think so. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it really did. Yeah. And the, the beat you were hearing, uh, Andrew, was, you know, this is the, the, the step dancing that is very... Uh, um, Arab and in some ways the Palestinians use it as kind of like to dance against oppression or whatever they call it. And so you, to hear that with electronic music, this yeah. very weird combination. I think anybody's <laughs> ever done that until 47 Soul. And they do have a CD, Andrew, if you want to see it. They've got a couple of other videos too that are kind of surreal. And I don't know. I don't know what they're on when they do the videos. <laughs> <laughs> <Fancy. laughs> well, I do appreciate you curating this entire list for us so that we could hear the music and watch the videos and see it as a group. So thank you for doing that. Thank you very much. And thank you for putting up with this beginner who's trying to use <laughs> Zoom. And like, it's very ambitious of me to try to speak and try to bring in videos and try to, you know, not, not, not bore you at the same time, not cheat you out of an experience. So to every person there, I can see, you know, Faiza and I can see Ai Young and there's Denise who helped me with everything. Uh, Denise, can, can I just say thank you to you? Um, did, do you want to say anything, Denise? Or do we have time, or how are we doing? I wonder. Does anybody want to talk about like how the whole? Um, you know, I try to give you samples, but do you, do you feel like do you have any comments about the entirety? Maybe Suraya, or if you want to uh, speak about anybody. I have a I have a comment I'd like to make, Professor Saltiak. I feel like, uh, music, just like most art, if someone is not guiding you through it, it's hard to interpret. Especially when it's in Arabic, right? If I were, as I was going through, you know, that too, even if there are subtitles, I, I kind of can piece together the message, but it's really hard to understand and appreciate the art form unless there's someone there that is trying to help me along and educate me a lot, especially if someone who doesn't have an artistic background. So I appreciate you, you spending your Friday uh, late afternoon with us and helping us and guiding us through this. Philip, that was so nice of you to say, because really, I would hear this from a lot of people, that, especially with the Arab Spring and me being in the Arab, you know, the Arabic instructor here at Stanford. And we had such a, an influx of students, American students, wanting to learn Arabic suddenly with the advent of the Arab Spring. And I would say, well, why are you learning Arabic? So, well, we want to know what are they saying in the street? What are these signs saying? They sound so powerful that they are mobilizing the masses and and then of course the songs and that's what gave me the idea to start my radio show which is called Arabology which I spent two hours a week doing exactly what you're talking about Philip sort of on the radio so they don't have to see me they can just hear me uh, you know talking about the song and then playing it the only difference between that and what we did today Philip is that I've added the visual component but I think that this music is really audio driven I mean you know, the visual just maybe adds or sometimes takes away from the song but it was uh, you know the it works very well on the radio when you explain it listeners call in and they're like oh this is what they're singing about although i don't speak arabic once you've contextualized it i was able to feel their pain or or feel the humor or whatever they were trying to to uh, uh, get across can i also add um i just wanted to thank you also it was just very emotional part of me i just couldn't even speak because oh. i could feel the um just how every artist were just poured their soul and their truth into their music and so i just was all choked up and um 
I wanted to say that it's just also so impressive to me how young people find the media that they, you know, they are operating with to, to propel change forward. And, and they're so raw and so honest and so young and, and naive and demanding at the same time. And, and it's just, um, I'm so grateful for that. And I mean, I'm just so grateful for the young generation. And um, one real quick, I just wanted to say, I come from Russia and um, there is a beautiful documentary that talks about how rock and roll um, broke the Soviet Union. Mm. And um, basically it's, it, it was all credited to the music. <laughs> so I hope the same would, ha you know, would, would happen in the Arab world as well. Absolutely, Marina. I mean. First of all, the fact that you were emotional shows that you don't have to speak the language to understand the message. And I tell you, some of this music, I mean, even as I'm playing it today, for you guys, I'm getting goosebumps because I know how hard it was for that kid or that singer to do it. And then also there's this, you know, this universal message of how many musicians are there in different parts of the world who are so talented that given a chance, they could become, they could change the world through their music. But because of their circumstances, you know, they... Uh, they, uh, they're largely go uh, ignored or unknown. So um, I think what happened in terms of rock and roll in Russia is exactly what's happening here. And it's, again, the power of music, I say always, where politics failed, music shall prevail. And I think that in terms of the Arab Spring, I just wanted everyone to know that uh, although it looks like it's uh, turned into chaos, the music has continued. And this song we've ended with was, you know, from last year. So you can see it's not just continuing, but they're adding different dimensions and tackling different subjects. So uh, we say in Arabic, shukran, Marina, that's uh, thank you for your very sweet comment and very powerful comment. Um, the artists are definitely uh, courageous. You can hear their boldness, their passion, their desire for freedom. And I did listen to um, one of the uh, pieces that Lauren Hill in the background, how she um, um, sung about rebel, 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 and uh, the, just the sense of urgency there. Um, and again, the movement, the passion, and you can hear um, in the lyrics their desire for peace, even though it comes across in some aspects uh, in an aggressive way, but the core of it is um, unity yeah. and peace and equality. Right. And so I appreciate how they have communicated that um, in their works. You know, it's, it's non-violence resistance. I mean, they're all telling you that because I think these kids know, these musicians know that, you know, any kind of uh, call to violence is not only unacceptable, but will actually be self-defeating because you're going to give the government the very, you know. But so there is anger, but the way they channel it artistically, I mean, you know, these are really, really oppressed kids who were born and uh, under these oppressive governments. And just the fact that they produced a song and put it on YouTube, I mean, what seems like a normal thing for us took maybe years. It took them having to find an internet connection of trying to do something where people will listen outside and it's a cry for help. But again, it's all about nonviolent resistance. Thank you. I just wanted to share an article that I posted on the chat. Uh, I read on how Palestinians and Israel are trying to come together because of a shortage of uh, tech talent. And so now, you know, there's some conversations going on and it seems like they're coming to, uh, together a little bit more. So just want to share that. Can you tell us, Don, about the article? Where, where, is it online? Yes, it's online. It's actually from the Wall Street Journal. And I read it. This was published uh, less than a week ago. And it talks about, uh, so let me just give you the, the headline. Desperate for tech talent, Israel turns to an untapped labor pool, Palestine. Wow. So again, maybe technology, maybe music, yeah. maybe it's these things, you maybe know, where it's sort of universal appeal and working together would, would actually embellish that. That's maybe right. this is what we've been missing all this time with the political rhetoric or whatever.
And I don't mean to take away from the struggle of Palestinians or of Israelis for independence and, and all those amazing people on both sides who continue to, you know, go to the streets and, and, and call for equality. Uh, but I do think that music has a very important part to play in any kind of peace process. And I hope that today I gave you a sample of how music actually changed things uh, and to the better in the case of Tunisia. All right, so uh, shall I say thank you uh, to everybody. I'm seeing, uh, I'm seeing you, all your beautiful faces there. Thank you so much. Shukran, thank you. Merci, grazie, toda, afghanistom, gracias. Uh, so I'm running out of languages, but that is thank you for joining me today, for putting up with my elementary knowledge of, of technology, but also for um, opening your hearts and your minds to, a mu to music that may initially sound a little bit foreign, but I think we had a beautiful discussion and I look forward to staying in touch. Um, you know, please um, uh, get in touch with me if you come across any kind of music, whether it's articles or music that you think might work for my radio show, I'm, you know, get in touch with me online and uh, send me an email and send me cultural productions and let's keep the conversation going. And, uh, you know, if it's something you think I should play on the radio, then you can always tune in to KZSU, Stanford's radio station, 94.1 FM, and listen to their apology. Thank you, guys. Shukran. Have one last question. You're speaking Arabic. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you again. Have a good weekend, everyone. Sure. Did you want to say goodbye, Denise? I'm going to turn Thank it over you. to Denise, who has been <laughs> so patient. There she is. I, I just want to thank you again for taking the time, for both taking us through this journey, contextualizing the music, and also giving us such a rich resource, and also having taken the time to come down here. Um, we spent about an hour or more together uh, really trying to test out the technology to see how we could make um, what Dr. Salti does best work in this medium and he was very open to you know learning together to do this and I think you know obviously your experience and expertise in your radio show really comes out too in the way that you you know really pull this together I really appreciate it deeply. thank That's you Denise to say. thank you thank you much. everybody thank you Silent clap. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> bye everyone thank you for your comments as well I was going to say that